<laughs> Daniel, you might ask, why are you in such a good mood today? Well, that's because my book, Breach of Peace's pre-order is live right now. And also my video where I announced that is like one of my best performing videos of all time. So I wanna say thank you guys so much for that. And if you're interested in checking out Breach of Peace, the link is in the description to pre-order it from all kinds of different booksellers. Now, okay, ha, 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 ha. We have a couple of books I'm very excited to talk about here today. Neither of which is out yet, sorry, but I know they're anticipated releases. So let's go ahead and start out with Son of the Storm by Sui Davis Okengboa. So this is quite the interesting fantasy story with a glaring flaw that overall still gets a positive review from me. Let's get into why. So this is an African inspired fantasy story with actual influences from across the spectrum. I really wanna commend the author and building a vibrant, rich fantasy world with very well understood culture and social dynamics that propel the narrative. And I know a lot of people are gonna be interested just based in that alone. This is one of those stories where pretty much all the conflict, the narrative thrust comes through characters interacting with their culture and the social dynamics set up and a lot of the investment is going to come from how these people clash and synergize or that's not the word I'm looking for and and meld well, you know what I'm saying, with each other. <laughs> Combine that with a magic system, Ebor, I hope I'm saying that right, that I find to be very alternative from a lot of the magic systems we're getting now. And Son of the Storm has a big ass appeal. Like this is something a lot of people are gonna be invested in because of the characters that are filled with personality, because of the world, all of that, as well as very commendable technical writing. This is a well-written book. I find the prose to not be the most spectacular ever, but they're solid all the way around. Cut in for like a really niche little thing, maybe 5% of people are gonna care about as much as I do. But in terms of like word choice when naming people or coming up with like fantasy names, having this African inspired, interesting kind of influence just really hit and I wanna praise that. It's a very specific thing, but I wanna give praise where it's due because I like it. Now, before I get into the rest of the pauses, I wanna talk about that one kind of issue though. I just wasn't super invested in the narrative. I was by the end of the book, kind of just feeling myself not having that desire to turn each and every single page. I liked the characters, I liked the world, but the story itself just didn't quite hook me enough, which sucks, but there's still enough here for me to definitely want to pick up the next book. This is the first in a series that's just getting started now. So for those of you who are looking for a new series, I think this could be one that you should definitely have on your radar. And a couple of the fantasy tropes that exist in this book, I found to be utilized in either the best way they could be or in a fresh and new way. Like I'm a big sucker for forbidden magic. Forbidden magic trope is very prevalent here. And the way it's presented, the atmosphere around the forbidden magic, the tone, the reverence, the fear, all of that worked. Uh, exceptionally well. I just found that to be absolutely wonderfully utilized. And then on top of that, I'm also a sucker for like rigid social dynamics in fantasy worlds and a lot of the, you know, character conflict coming from their issues with the existing world and a well-established culture. All of that super fresh, super interesting how it's utilized. Of course, real parallels to our world, the African inspiration with the history there coming in quite strongly. Uh, all of that just seriously commendably well done. This author writes with flair, they have a distinct feel to them. I just feel like this book got bogged down in doing a lot of legwork that ended up detracting from the overall thrust of the narrative, which is a bit of a bummer, yet because it still managed to pull off what it pulled off, I'm going to pick up the next book. I'm invested for the second and I'm here for it. So this one, uh, keep on your radars as a big appeal, something to check out, maybe wait for the sequel, see how that's received. But overall, uh, I'm praising it, especially the like skin tone dynamics that are going on in the social structure and the way certain characters don't fall into the trope you think they'll fall into for being this like lesser cat it's it's all very well handled. Every time a fantasy book hits something on a different direction, a different angle, I'm always in the comment section seeing like what people's response to that, whether they kind of have a different take than myself or they agree with what my interpretation was. Oking Boa did something pretty Pretty neat. Overall though, for Son of the Storm, I'm feeling a very strong 6.5 out of 10. I also just quickly want to ask Orbit, why did you send me this book twice? Like I, I, I appreciate it, but 
I, I don't need one for each hand. Now we shift gears and head on into Mark Lawrence territory. Now this is a book that was sent to me again early and I'm sorry, I know it's kind of frustrating to see me talk about books you can't read. Now, this is the sequel to The Girl in the Stars, and it's The Girl in the Mountain, setting place in the same world as the Book of the Ancestors series. This book made me go, oh, hi, Mark. And I mean that in every way, because not only is it, hey, my first time getting back into Mark Lawrence in a minute, but also it reminded me of why I love his writing in his previous books so much, except for a couple exceptions. If you remember last year, I wasn't the biggest fan of The Girl in the Stars. I thought it was could. It just didn't have enough spice to really uh, interest me as a reader beyond a casual liking. This book, though, reminded me it's Mark f***ing Lawrence, and this guy is kind of known for like having a, okay, interesting first book, and then just excelling from there, and that's what he's done once again. The Girl in the Stars, similar to Son of the Storm, did a lot of legwork in setting up a different era for this same world we saw in Book of the Ancestor. Now, The Girl in the Mountain is reaping the benefits. The characters in Book 1 I found to be just fine. Here, though, their evolution, their next steps are fascinating, and the connections the world Mark Lawrence is building is his most impressive yet. Seeing this greater extension, this expansion upon what he's done in a previous series is absolutely astounding. He's doing a wonderful job of not only elevating the lore, but the wider political climate of everything we're watching. And with what we know from Book of the Ancestor, if you've read that, you're going to greatly have an additional benefit reading this book as well, because there's so many little nuggets that tie into that world. I've seen multiple people saying it's not required reading to get through Book of the Ancestor to read The Girl in the Stars. I agree, and it's still not required reading to read The Girl in the Mountain, but I think you will have a wider appreciation for a lot of the work being done by the author if you have read it because there is heavier tie-ins than the first book. Overall, I think this is just a giant step up from the first book. I, I, I don't know what to say as a reviewer because I see why I didn't enjoy the first book as much. It's just frustrating because I think there could have been some changes to make that book more interesting on its own and still have all the setup that's needed for this second book to pick up off from. Yaz is still my favorite character. She's the star of the first and second book, and watching her evolution, her relationships develop, is some of Mark Lawrence's fantastic work we see with relationships ongoing. Where people will still struggle with this, I think, is the pacing. This book is oddly paced. A lot happens, then it slows down, then there's just whip left, whip right. This could be one where if you're very sensitive to uh, inconsistent pacing, pacing, it could seriously harm your enjoyment for this second book, though that's an area I don't find a lot of people to have, like, okay, unless something is painfully slow for the entire book, most people can get past some odd pacing. I'm weirdly, like, more frustrated with the first book now <laughs> than I've finished the second, because, like, I like the relationships, I like this core group of friends so much better, I understand them more, even, like, their powers are more interesting to me, so just looking back at the first book, it's like, why couldn't this level have been seen there. I just, I'm not sure where his focus was. Um, but yeah, the second book I'm putting up there in the same league as my enjoyment of Book of the Ancestor. I think this is a really nice showing, and now I'm highly anticipating the third book of this series. With this book not even being out yet and Mark Lawrence being so popular, I don't want to say much more detailed beyond that. People get angry when I do so. I do just want to comment on a lot is resolved rapidly in this book. And then new things are set up and the book ends on an overall kind of cliffhanger note, but it never felt cheap to me. It felt like a very natural progression. Mark Lawrence knows how to handle story and narrative, but I'm going to be looking to see what people think of how rapidly certain plot lines are just cut off, handled, resolved from the first book. So it kind of felt like to me, this book could go to a wider, uh, broader vision that the author seems to have now. And for The Girl in the Mountain, I'm feeling a eight out of 10. Let me know if you've read the first book in this series, if you're gonna pick up the second, if you like the first one more than me or less, let me know why in the comments down below. Anyway guys, like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you wanna support what I do here. And have a good one, y'all. Peace. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my latest high tier Patreons, Verandi, Brandon Bennett, and Crossland Show. Hope you guys are having a good one.